Yosef not only interprets the dreams, but he decides to give the Pharaoh a lot of advice. <laughs> he says, here how you should be a good Pharaoh. This is what you gotta do. You know, appoint somebody who has wisdom and insight and sapience and wherewithal. And this person is gonna set things up. The obvious question is, why is Yosef giving advice? That's not what the Pharaoh asked for. He just said, interpret my dream. But the point is, that is the interpretation of the dream. The interpretation of the dream is, God is doing this, this is coming, and you need to act. And that is the only thing that fully explains how and why the Pharaoh dreamt what he dreamt. So the response on the Pharaoh's part in the third reading is ecstatic. He says, we're never gonna find anybody wiser. This is the man. No question about it. And Pharaoh says to Joseph, I have placed you over the land of Egypt. Take a look in verse 42. The Pharaoh begins the process. Vayasar pare es tabate me'al yode. The Pharaoh takes his ring off his hand. Vayiten oisa al yad Yosef. He himself places it upon the hand of Joseph. Vayal be'shoisei big de'shesh. He dresses him in linen clothing. Yosim Revid Hazov al Tzavare, he places the chain of office around his neck. Verse 42. Let's take a look at Rashi. By Yosar Pare es Tabate. The Pharaoh took his ring off. So Rashi says, Nesinas Tabas Hamelech, the giving of the ring of the king, he ois is a sign, Lemi Shenoisnaloi. So it's a sign for the one that the king gives it to. And what's it a sign of? It's a, it's a sign, that he should be viceroy, second to him alone. Rashi doesn't go into the details of what exactly the ring does or doesn't signify, but he says you should know that that's the meaning of the ring. When it says the Pharaoh took off the ring, he ringed Yosef, that's the meaning of ringing him. So for example, over the ages, ringing people have had many different connotations. Even in today's modern day and age, when an engineer graduates, he has to be ringed by another engineer. And the engineers wear a special engineering ring. So there is this idea of ringing somebody and the ringing done in a certain way, and in that way, it's an act of empowerment. The Ramban says this is very practical. He says, Tabas HaMelech was the signet ring. The signet ring was in times of antiquity, when there would be a royal decree, the king would make an impression with his ring into the clay and that would make something go live. That's the equivalent of the president signing something into law. And so, the signet ring was essentially indicative that this person was, in the Ramban's words, Nagid, he was leader, ruler, or Mitzava, the Chol Malchus, he would be the one to instruct the entire kingdom. Why? Because now, he has the signet ring with which he can make the official seal. So, Practically speaking, whatever he decides will go into law will actually become law because he has the wherewithal, the ability to sign things into law. Of course, this brings to mind the story of Purim, where Achashverosh takes off his ring and he gives it to Haman. And now Haman can do as he pleases. Of course, this is a positive one. So that's the story with the ring. Big day sheish, what's up with the linen clothes? Rashi says, Devar chashivas hu b'mitzrayim. This was something very prominent in Egypt. I suppose this is the Egyptian ermine. This is talking about the, a, a, a kind of fabric, a textile, which is very unique, very special. And in Egypt, if you wore linen, you were like the upper cut. That put you in the realm of nobility. Ravid, the chain of office. What does this mean? So Rashi first says, this means anak. This is a, a chain that goes around one's neck. Because it's comprised of individual rings, that's why it's called a vid. It's because it's made of many pieces. Now, if you never saw a picture of the ancient Egyptian kings, you don't really understand what this means. So yeah, sure, every chain is made of many links. But if you've seen pictures of the ancient kings, with that kind of design that goes across, across the chest, that's made up of individual pieces. That's the chain of office we're talking about. That's exactly what we refer to when we say chain of office, that Yosef wore this very, very fancy, it's kind of an ornament. It's not, like a, it's not like a ring as you think of it today as like little rings. It's not a little chain. 
This was a, a heavy metal thing made up of individual plates. The chain, similarly, we find in the scripture, in the book of Mishlei, we find Marvadim Rovadati Arsi. And the intimation is Ratsafti Arsi Mirzofes, that the, the beds were, so to speak, set up together. Now, when you think of rings in the European sense, that doesn't really make sense. It doesn't, the, the imagery Rashi is invoking does not bring to mind the imagery that he's cross referencing. But when you think of those Egyptian these pictures, right, with, around the neck with those pieces, that's exactly what it is. It covers the whole neck. It's all, so to speak, piece, one piece next to the other. And Rashi says, Bolshen ha Mishnah, in the language of the Mishnah, it's Mukov Reivdin Shal Oven. There was rows of, of stone, one after the other. And this is talking about the area of the Beis HaMikid, where the Kuryanim used to sleep, and they would have this indented stone. So they'd be like stone shelves, but the stones would be one on top of the other. And that would be like a wall that was staggered stone. And then it says like, al Revid Harvi Sheba Azara, that they used to place one of the vessels of the Beis HaMikdash on the fourth stone or the fourth, the fourth step of the Azara, the Ritzpa, and this was something that was entirely covered with stone a flagstone. So the covering, this is the chain of office that we're referring to over here. So now, now it just makes sense. I wonder if Rashi ever saw a picture of it or even understood it in the visual sense as we do today because, you know, these things have just come out of the ground, out of their mummies. At any rate, the next thing the Pharaoh does is Vayarka He has him mounted or riding in Air Force Two, in the secondary chariot, Ashaloi, which he had. By Yikru Lofonov, and they proclaim before him, Avreich, he's an Avreich. Venos and Oisai, I'll call Eretz Mitzrayim. Thus, he was placed over all of Egypt. Okay, what does this mean? B'merkavas HaMishnah, Rashi says, this is a Merkava, a chariot or a vehicle, Hashniel and Merkavtai, which is second only to the royal chariot or transportation mechanism that the king used. Hamahalechas Eitzel Shalai, the one that goes along with the pharaohs. So Merkevis HaMishnah literally means the secondary chariot. And Rajbam suggests that it's not actually a chariot, but rather an animal. He said there was the steed of the king, and then there was the viceroy steed. And he got to mount that steed. Ramban and Radak maintained that it was a very well-known vehicle, a vehicle that was known to be reserved only for the second in command, which is why I use the terminology of Air Force Two. Air Force One, the president rides, Air Force Two, the vice president rides, our prime minister has no plane. <laughs> 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 this is the way it is. They commandeer like some, uh, <laughs> some military jet when they need something. Vayikru lufonov avrech. They proclaimed Avrech. What in heaven does Avrech mean? What were they proclaiming Avrech for? So Rashi says, if you take a look in the Targum, Kitagumi, Ungulus renders it, Dein Abba Lamalka. This is like the father for the king, meaning the one who is responsible. Like a father or a mother are responsible for the household. This is the father figure of the monarchy. And Rashi says, how does that become word Av Reich? Well, Av we know means a father, but he says Reich, Boshen Arami, the word Reich and Aramit, according to another opinion in, the, in Roman language, is Melech. Hmm. And in Germany, what do they call it? A Reich. Same terminology, same language. So we have this expression in the Gemara in Perik HaShutfen, in Mesechus Baba Basra in the beginning. It says, Loi Reika, Loi Ba Reika. I'm not a king, I'm not the son of a king. And that's what Unculus means when he says, Dein Abba Lamalka. Dein Abba Lamalka means Av Reich, father for the king. But this is like a little far fetched that Av Reich means father for the king. Because it doesn't sound like a conjunctive word. What does the word itself mean? But with Divra Agada, therefore Rashi adds words of Agada. He says, Darash of Yehuda, Yehuda expounded in this word. And he said, Av Reich is a Yosef. Av Reich is not a general terminology. It's not. A, 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 a word which is used to describe the second in command, or the person who's going to be the CEO of the company, the one who's going to be responsible for the king's affairs, the chief of staff, if you will. No, that's not what it means. 
And how do we know that? Because besides Yosef, this word is never used again. And if the word actually means that, how come the word isn't used? All the examples that he brings here are connected to Reich, not to Av. Av is self-understood. Mm -hmm. The word Av Reich itself shows up nowhere. So that's a problem. So Rashi can't just leave it as Av Reich, that, yeah, that's what Av Reich means because this is a word that never shows up anywhere else. And therefore, we have Rabbi Yehuda who is expounding and saying, you're right. Av Reich does mean Av and Reich, but it's never used for anybody else. It's only for Yosef that this terminology is used. And that's because who Av the Chochmah, he is like a father in wisdom, meaning experienced, but Rach Bishonim, he's very tender in years. He was only 30 years old. He's 30 years old. He's becoming the mightiest, second most powerful man in the world. He's a very young person. Av Reich. So, but incidentally, this is what a lot of times people who study in a koil, they're called an avrech. Why? Because they study a lot of Torah, supposedly. So they're supposedly very wise, but they're very young in years. So somebody later graduates, moves on, then he's called a rav, a rabbi, whatever. But for somebody who's not yet a rabbi, but nonetheless learn it in Torah, so we call him an avrech, which means av b'chachma and rech b'shan. Amr let Rabbi Yaisi ben Durmaskis, Rabbi Yaisi of Damascus said, he says, Oy vey. How long are you going to play this game and twist and, and turn the psukim to fit, fit your, your thing? That's not what it means. The word avrech comes from kneeling. It means knees. You kneel. The person you kneel before is the person everybody is subservient to. It's a word that describes subservience. It's not a special word describing Yesus' unique conditions, being so wise yet young. Like it says, The Pharaoh said, I will place you over the land of Egypt. So if the Pharaoh says, I place you over the land of Egypt, then the idea of I place you over the land of Egypt represents what? That everybody kneels before him. So this is the kneeling. That's what we're talking about here. The day of kneeling. Everybody kneels. This is the simple pshat as Rashi explains it. In the other Mepharshim, there's a lot of discussion of this business of Avrech. For example, the Tur says that the word Avrech is also a conjunction of the word Bracha. And he says, everybody blesses the king, so to speak. In the Sepharno, we have this idea of, every, of, 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 of both like Havrech, he says, which is like a command, people kneeled, and they would cry before him, cry out before him. Rabbeinu Bechaya says that Avrech represents the idea of two words of Av and Odoin, because here was a person who went from nowhere, a meteoric rise. He was a, he was a slave, he was a, he was a jailbird. And now he went through, smashed all the glass ceilings. That's why it's called Avrech, two fancy words to describe his greatness. Instead of just Reich, we called him Avrech. So we have this the middle interpretation in Rashi, which is about kneeling, right? So let's take a look now in the beauty of Chumash quickly before we go on to our davening this morning on page Reish The Rebbe re re notes the following. Tzadok Bir. From the words that we, 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 we just read, this business of Avrech being L'shem Birkayim, being a permutation of knees, and kneeling, that everybody would kneel, and this was a sign of Yosef's supremacy, his sovereignty. <coughs> so with regard to Yosef's brothers, though, what does it say, what did the people do? When the brothers came, it says, They bowed low. Their faces were literally in the ground. Which this, as explained by Rashi, They spread themselves flat on their faces. Literally fell on their faces. And Rashi there says, Whenever the Torah uses the terminology, It means, It means flat out. Not kneeling, but flat out. So kneeling is a sign of subservience. Falling on your face is a much more serious sign of commitment and subjugation. So from that Pasuk, and this is a Pasuk in the same Parsha, it's mashma, it seems, that the custom was not to kneel before Joseph, but rather to prostrate oneself <coughs> before Joseph. As one would prostrate themselves before a very king. Well, in that case, how could we appreciate this language of Avreich, which is Lashem Berkayim. And here, Rabbi Yisim in Damascus says, Admos, se'atama aves. For how long are you going to twist the words of the Pasuk? It's straightforward. He's the person everybody kneels before. 
In fact, he's not the person everybody kneels before, he's the person everybody <coughs> prostrates themselves before. And here you're suggesting that his, the terminology avrech is Lashem Berkayim. So the Rebbe says the truth is very simple. Yosef Achen Lehoyu Melech Lechaldova. He was not actually the king. Why wasn't he the king? Because a king is not in power by dint of virtue of somebody else granting him power. That's not a king. He didn't come to the monarchy with his own virtue. And like it says, the Pharaoh is the one who placed him. And he said, the throne will tower above you. But that's all. But the throne did tower above him. Therefore, they didn't prostrate themselves and bow before Yosef. So why did Yosef's brothers do it? A bunch of Yidin show up in Mitzrayim. They have no idea of what you're supposed to do in front of an Egyptian king. Everybody knows. And the viceroy, you kneel. And the pharaoh, you bow. These guys are terrified. They're a bunch of Yidin. They just came to get some food. All of a sudden, they're in this big fancy throne room. This monster is screaming at them. They don't know what to do. They fell on their faces. It's not a question. Yosef's brothers did something. They didn't know what else to do. Simple. That's why they bowed, bowed low on their face. But now the Rebbe does something unbelievable. He says, okay, that's on a pshat level. It's not hard to understand. But really and truly, there's something much more profound and deeper going on beneath the surface. Malchus Yosef, who's semelah Malchus Shemayim. Yosef's monarchy ultimately is symbolic of the reign of heaven. His batlus pifne Yosef, the sense of humility before Yosef, who's hat tzaddik, humbling oneself before the tzaddik, this is kamoya ki his batlus pifne machusay, shal HaKadosh Baruch this is like the famous line that Yosef sends to, 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 to Yankiv. He says, Samani alikim I place God as the master over Egypt. So the way, one way of interpreting it is, Samani alikim. I place God, not God placed me. I place God as the master. Yosef brought morale, tried to bring morality to the country. He tried to make our Kaddish Baruch Hu part of the fabric of Egyptian society. In other words, his batlusim shal anshe mitzrayim b'fnei Yosef when the people were nullified, when the people were subservient to Yosef, ultimately Yosef tried to bring them into a higher kind of spiritual consciousness, an awareness of the Creator. Now, the Egyptians, they couldn't really be brought along so far. How far, did, how far could they go? They could kneel, but that's all. They're ready to kneel before Yosef representing the Malchus of Shemayim. But the brothers of Yosef, subconsciously and intuitively understood and stood before Yosef, the Yosef at Tzadik, they were capable of a much higher level of bitol, and therefore they didn't only kneel, in fact, they prostrated themselves. So the Pshat has a beautiful mystical teaching behind it, explaining to us the importance of bitol, of renoun renouncing one's self-importance, and bowing before the Tzadik, which ultimately represents the idea of being subservient to our Kaddish Baruch Hu. This we shall conclude for today. Fail of the